Hello, welcome to White Baby Gardening and Worm Farm. Today we'll be having another gardening Q&A discussion where we are going to be discussing hot and cold composting. Okay, so thank you. Yes. What is composting? Composting is decomposing organic matter into a simpler organic and inorganic matter. Now, what type of organic matter can be composted? You can compost food scraps, plant refuse, paper, cardboard, animal dung, and animal carcasses. So anything that is organic can be composted. So as we go through the discussion, we're going to be looking at hot composting. We're going to be comparing it with cold composting. We are going to be looking at how you can hot compost and what you can do if your material is not heating up. So we're going to be discussing also the benefits of compost in your garden. So we're going to be discussing quite a bit about compost. Yes, so as I mentioned, you can compost animal carcasses. But what is the drawback with composting animal carcasses? First of all, they smell, they attract rodents and other pests, and they should not be handled with your naked hands because of the germs that they may spread. And they also take a really long time to break down. So if you have animal carcass, while you can compost it, it is better for you to actually bury it in your garden if you want the benefit from it in your garden now if you're going to be burying animal carcasses for compost then it is a good idea to bury it at least two feet deep because a lot of rodents and pests will actually dig down into the soil in order to reach to the material that you have buried in it Now, what is the difference between hot and cold composting? Hot composting requires regular attention and heat in order for the material to break down quickly. Whereas cold composting, you don't do anything to it more than gather the material, put it down and you leave it for however long it takes for it to break down. So really there is only two steps when it comes to cold composting, and that is to gather the material and to sit and wait for it to do its thing. So now we're going to be looking at the advantages and the disadvantages of hot and cold compost. Just a minute, please. Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, so let's look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of hot and cold composting. 
Hot composting breaks down your organic matter much, much faster than cold composting. Cold composting, however, does not require much of your time and thus it is much cheaper for you to produce. As we go further in the discussion, you're going to see why it is cheaper to produce. Hot composting helps to destroy seeds and weeds and some pathogens that may be in your composting material, whereas cold composting does not. Hot composting produces a greater volume of compost than cold composting does. Cold composting does not require turning and it does not require you adding moisture to it. Hot composting may take anything from six weeks to six months, depending on what it is that you are composting, whereas cold composting can take anything from one to two years to compost. Cold composting does not kill seeds and pathogens, as we mentioned before. Cold composting is more ideal for people who have lots of space so they can afford to create quite a lot of compost piles. And for those who are very busy and so they don't have time to maintain a hot compost because hot, maintaining hot compost actually takes quite a lot of time and energy too. Hot composting help you to make to have a steady supply of compost because in a matter of weeks or a few months you can have compost whereas if you're going to be doing cold composting then if you have to sit and wait until it breaks down on its own and if you're in cold countries then waiting for cold composting to actually complete the process takes quite a bit of time. Whereas hot composting, it is more ideal for people in warmer environment and if you're in, co sorry, in cold environment because you only have so much time during the growing season when it is warm enough for you to be able to compost. And so for that reason, if you're in cold environment, and you have the time and the resources or the energy to do so, then hot composting is a better option. Hi, Russell. Yes. Now, how do you hot compost? To generate heat in your compost pile, you should have your pile or build your pile so that it is at least three feet wide, three feet high, and three feet thick. That way it will be able to produce sufficient heat to break down the material faster. It can be larger than three by three by three feet, but they recommend a minimum of three feet either way. Now a high source of nitrogen is needed in order to do hot composting because the nitrogen is what is going to produce the heat in your compost pile. Hot compost pile need to be moistened regularly and turn regularly in order to improve the airflow and to ensure that the pile keep on eating up. Now, what are the three things that are needed in order to hot compost. You need organic matter that you're going to be composting, you need air supply, and you need water. So by saying you need air supply, it doesn't mean that you're going to have to source air. It just simply means that you have to have regular airflow through your compost pile. And that is why you turn your compost regularly so that you can improve the airflow in it. Now, how long does it take for compost pile to actually start eating up? 
it can take if the pile is built properly so if your pile is a minimum of three feet by three feet by three feet with the right amount of organic matter good airflow and moisture your compost pile can eat up within 24 to, to 36 hours so it actually does not take very long now what is the ideal temperature for hot composting the ideal temperature is between 140 to 155 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 to 68.3 degrees Celsius. You don't want your hot compost to go over 160 because then you'll be killing off your beneficial bacteria and your beneficial microbes that are in the soil or in the compost. So you don't want it to go over 160 degrees Fahrenheit. How long does it take compost pile to maintain its heat? It usually takes a few days to a week, after which the pile will start to cool down. Now what can you do if the pile is cooling down? You can turn the pile and add more water to it, and that will cause the process to start heating up or the compost to start heating up again. Of course, your compost pile will only eat up for so long, and we're going to be discussing that a little bit further on in the discussion. So do you guys compost, and what method do you use to compost? Do you use the cold method or the hot method? Now, what is the best way to turn your compost pile? When turning your compost pile, you want to put the material that is in the middle of the pile to the outside of the pop, um, to the outer portion of your compost pile, and the one that was on the outside, you want to put that in the middle. And you don't want the reason why you want to make sure that the portion that was in the middle is on the outside, and what was on the outer portion would be inside, is to ensure that everything gets processed evenly you want to make sure that all of the compost goes through that heat process you don't want to be hot composting and not following the proper procedure because you may end up with one portion of your compost where the pathogens and the seeds in it went through the heat process and so those die off and the other portion that was not allowed to go through the heat process will have seeds and the pathogens in them. So for that reason, you want to ensure that you rotate where the portions of your compost pile goes. And the middle of your compost pile is the part that is going to be the hottest at all times. So for that reason, you have to make sure that you're turning the pile and making sure that everything is evenly distributed. Is there a proper ratio of nitrogen to carbon for your composting material? The ratio on this, or the belief where this is concerned is actually conflicting because you will hear some professionals say a two to one ratio is good. So two parts carbon-based material to one part nitrogen-based material is the ratio you're, you're to use, whereas you will find others that says as much as up to 30 times more carbon compared to nitrogen. So it is actually conflicting. So the best method or the best way to deal with this situation then is to do your own experiment. So you might want to, if possible, create two different compost piles and use different ratio. The minimum they recommend is two parts carbon to one part nitrogen. So you can do this ex experiment and you can do another one using whatever ratio of carbon to one part nitrogen that you choose. 
use them on your plants so use them separately and then observe how the plants react to it to find out which is the better ratio now you can also get your compost tested if you are in doubt as to whether or not your material has the sufficient nutrients in it where depending on the ratio that you are using so i mentioned carbon-based material and nitrogen-based material so what are your carbon-based and what are your carbon-based material carbon-based material include things like dried leaves wood chips shredded paper cardboards stuff like that is considered your carbon-based material what is the nitrogen-based material it includes things like your grass clippings your plant refuse your kitchen scraps and the stuff like that so those are your nitrogen base material so what terms what does the terms browns and greens mean because a lot of time when talking about compost you hear people using the term browns and you hear them using the term greens so what does brown mean what does greens mean so for brown it refers to anything that is carbon based some people say anything organic that is brown and others might say the green would be anything that is green but that is not necessarily the case because you can have car um nitrogen based material that is actually brown in color so you, it's not a matter of the actual color, it's just a matter of whether it is carbon-based or it is nitrogen-based. For example, grass. Your grass clip, clippings is green initially when you cut it. At that point in time, it is nitrogen-based. When the grass clippings dries, it becomes carbon-based because it loses most of the nitrogen that is in it. So it's not a matter of color, it's more about whether or not it is rich in nitrogen or it is rich in carbon. Now, how can you heat or speed up the heating process of your compost? There are several steps that you can take to heat up, to speed up the process. So when you are starting the worm bin, if you had material that is already composted, just a handful will do, or worm castings that will help to start the, the composting process a lot faster. You can add urine to it because it is rich in nitrogen or ammonia. You can add beer to it. You can add these material and What's that material called that they use in the bokashi? Um, bran. Bran also has a, a high level of nitrogen in it that will cause the material to heat up quickly. So you can add that as well to your material, um, to your compost material, and you can add animal manure because animal manure is also very rich in nitrogen. So that will speed up the eating process. Now, after you have the heat process has started in your compost, should you keep adding more material to that hot compost pile? You should not add more material. Once the heat process has started, you should not be adding more material to that compost pile. It is better to actually start a new pile with fresh material because once you start adding new material to a compost pile that is already heating up it is either going to slow down the process or it is going to stop the heat process it will also take a whole lot more time 
for the composting process to be completed if you had a new material to it. So sometimes you will hear beginners who are composting complaining that their material stop heating up. Sometimes it can be because it doesn't have enough airflow or enough moisture in it, or it does not have enough nitrogen-based material in it, or it could be that you keep on adding material to it after it has started the heat process. So it's not recommended that you had anything to it. It's just better to start a new compost pile. Now, what should you do if after several weeks of eating up, your pile suddenly stop eating up and no matter what you do, you can't seem to get it to start the heat process again. The only thing you need to do at that point in time is to just keep turning the compost and adding water to it. Compost will heat up for only so long and after that, it has reached the saturation point, for lack of a better word. So it can only heat up for so long. So once it has reached that stage where it can heat up no further, the only thing you need to do is just keep turning it and adding water to it. Some people at this point in time will try to add more nitrogen-based material to the compost pile with the hope that it will actually heat up some more. But doing so, as I mentioned before, is not a good idea. It will slow down the process. And if, you, if the compost has reached the point where it has heat up as much as it possibly can for as long as it possibly can, it means that your compost is almost at the point where you can actually harvest it. So if you're going to be adding fresh material to it at that point in time, what you're just doing is preventing yourself from being able to harvest the finished compost and it's going to take even longer for you to be able to use the compost that is already finished. So don't add anything else to it, just keep turning it and adding water. Okay, now how can you know if your compost has reached the optimum temperature for composting? You can use a thermometer if you have one. If you don't have a thermometer, it's no big deal. You can still figure out if your compost is heating up enough. All you need to do is in the center of your compost pile, be careful while doing this, put your fist there. And if you cannot keep your fist in that material for more than a few seconds, then it means that your compost has reached the optimum temperature. So that is how you can figure it out if you don't have a, comp a thermometer. Now, when should you turn your compost? Does it really matter? You should, once you start, oh, hi, Nikki. Once you start the composting process, that means once you have created the pile and the pile is at the required, yes, weekly. Once you have created that pile and it is at the required size, which is three feet by three feet by three feet, then you want to allow four days in which you do nothing at all to the pile. During that four days, it's going to cause the moisture that is in the pile to equalize and it is going to allow the beneficial bacteria to be established after the four days have passed, then you may want to turn your material once or twice per week. And you're going to make sure that you keep doing this because 
after a few days, as we mentioned before, the heat process will actually slow down within a few days to a week. So you want to keep on turning it and adding water to it every week because that is going to encourage the heat process to continue and it's going to encourage the compost to break, to keep breaking down faster. If you don't do it regularly, then you can end up with the compost taking a lot longer than it should to break down. And another reason why you need to keep turning your compost. Hi, Leafy Wiggy. Yes, another reason why you need to keep turning your compost is because you don't want it to go anaerobic. Because if you're using the heat process, it means that you have created, you have now created a pile that is a minimum of three feet high and three feet wide. All of that is going to gradually start to compress. So the hair flow through it is not going to be as much as before. So that is one of the reasons why you have to keep turning the compost because you need to have that airflow in order for the compost to break down properly and for it to break down fast enough for you to be able to have compost to use. And especially so if you're living in a cold environment where you know you have long winters because you only have so much warm weather in order to get your compost finished. Of course, if you are living in an area where you have a large acreage or large property, it doesn't really matter much because you can create a lot of compost pile. So you can set them up in stages. When one is ready, one is getting started, one is already partially on the way. But a lot of people don't really have that option. See, Russ says, thanks for the good and in-depth information about compost. I have been taking a break and listening. I can take a break and learn at the same time. Okay, you're very welcome, Russell. Yes. Now, there are people who would love to compost, but where they're living, they do not have the space to create compost. Hi, sunny day girl. You're very welcome, my dear. Yes, yeah, so there are people who, based on where they're living, they might not be able to create their own compost, but they're producing the food scraps and they are, they may have small gardens, whether they are co container gardening or they have a small garden in their backyard, but it's just not enough space for them to actually compost. If that is the case, what can such persons do to ensure that they have compost? There's an easier method for such individuals than it is for us who are actually going to do the actual composting. So if you have garden space, but you don't have space to do compost, what you can do is simply bury the food scraps in your garden. So it is recommended that, depending on what it is that you're composting, if you're composting something that, like meat, then you need to bury it at least two feet deep. If you're composting food scraps, you can go 12 to 18 inches deep. You can bury it into the entire garden, or you can dig trenches and put the food scraps in there, and that will produce compost in your garden and you don't have to go there and turn the compost. You don't have to water the compost because when you're watering your garden, then the material that you buried will be getting water as well. If you're planting in containers, then what you can do is at the end of each growing season, you can put food scraps in the bottom of your container and then when you're ready to plant or when you're ready to put your, when you're ready to plant, then you had your potting soil on top of that. That will stay, stay there and gradually break down and provide nutrients for your plants. And because it is buried, then it won't attract fruit flies and rodents. 
So this is another option for you if you do container gardening and you don't have space to do composting. Sometimes you might not have a lot of space, but you have a small amount of space. So you can use those small containers, even just a caddy underneath your kitchen sink and compost it there. You have to keep in mind, however, that compost composting material is decomposing material, which means that it can have a smell. So you need to take the necessary steps to ensure that it does not smell. So keeping it covered, putting the food scraps and covering it, it, covering it with the carbon-based material will help to keep down smell and make sure that you keep it covered so that it does not attract or at least it does not get fruit flies and other pests in it. Your compost should not smell, whether indoors or outdoors. Your compost should not smell, at least it should not have a foul odor. If your compost has a foul odor, it means that it does not have enough air supply or your material is too soggy. If your material is too soggy, it means that your air supply is going to be restricted. So for your compost, that is another reason why you need to turn it to keep that hair flow through it so that it does not smell. So you can know if your compost is okay when it has an earthy smell. So just like worm casting, compost is supposed to have an earthy smell. So if it does not have an earthy smell, it means that you need to aerate the content of your compost. Now, when you have finished cast, <laughs> not castings, but compost, when your composting process has completed, it is a good idea to allow it to cure for a while. So you might want to allow the compost to sit for a few weeks or a month. And the reason why you allow it to sit is if you're doing hot composting, the material is going to be warm. You don't really want to put warm material around your plants, especially if it's going to be very delicate plants like lettuces and stuff like that. So allowing it to cure, give it time to cool off. Not only that, but the compost has just gone through the heat process. There are some beneficial bacteria that can survive in that heat. There are other beneficial bacteria that cannot survive in that heat. And so you will find those on the outer perimeter of your compost. By allowing it to sit, these beneficial bacteria can build their population. So you allow that microbial or bacterial entity to stabilize their population before you actually use it in your garden. Okay, you have to leave now. No worries. Have a good afternoon. Yes, so allowing it to cure will actually allow the microbes and the beneficial bacteria in your compost to stabilize. Now, what nutrients can be found in compost? It contains all your primary nutrients. So your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium. These are nutrients that can be found in compost. Let's see, Russell says, how to take off safety glasses, hair protection, and gas mask. Finish mixing in lime and diatomaceous earth into shredded compost. After this, I will add worm chow into appropriate bucket mix. Okay, then I will add a measured amount of water containing pond enzymes and Bt. Then I will mix again. I will let the bucket, the buckets with feed in them, sit, sit up for, for use on Friday. Okay, it's a nice mix. The other buckets without worm chow can be used after twenty four hours. Okay, good information. 
Yes, so the nitrogen, sorry, the nutrients in your compost is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It also contains the micronutrients and trace minerals. So that would mean it contains things like sulfur, calcium, copper, magnesium, magnesium, manganese, and stuff like that, boron. So all of these micronutrients and trace minerals can be found in your compost. Some the trace minerals, it's only in small amount that they are found in your compost. And so sometimes if the plant is lacking these things, then you maybe you might need to add other sources that will provide these trace minerals. Now, what are some benefits of, oh, yes, yeah, so the amount of um, nutrients that your compost actually contain is dependent on the material that you composted. So if you composted, for example, a lot of browns, then the nutrients that it would get, the compost would have if you had included greens, would not be there, or it would be less. If you had too much of one and too little of the other, then you're going to have a lot of one type of nutrients compared to the other. So the amount of nutrients that is in your compost is dependent on what your compost comprised of. Now, what are some benefits of compost? For one, it regulates the soil pH. It improves soil texture. It retains moisture. It encourages microbes in your soil. It reduces waste in your landfill. It provides nutrients for your plants. It has very little harmful chemicals because most of what you had to your compost pile would be organic matter. Of course, you know that if you go to the store and you buy fruits and vegetables and you put that the refuse from it in your garden, Whatever they use to treat that fruit or to cure the fruit or to preserve the fruit, all of that is going to be in your compost. So that is why I mentioned that it will have very little harmful substance because it will have some amount of substance in there that you would rather not be there. But yes, it will have some amount of whatever you put in. It is also very gentle on your plant. So compost actually have a similar nutrients base as that of worm castings, except that for worm castings, the amount is up to five, well, they say five to 20 times more than what is actually in compost, but they have similar nutrients it's just that the amount in castings is actually more than what can be found in compost so compost can be used in your garden sometimes you may need to add other sources of nutrients and again that is also dependent on to an extent what you what your compost is made of So I mentioned that compost contains trace amounts of minerals. If you want to increase the trace minerals in your compost, then adding a lot of shredded leaves, which is higher in carbon, will increase these trace minerals in your compost. Okay, so let's see. 
Hi, Mac Bajan. Yes, so I must apologize. I really wanted to put together a lot more information on compost for you guys, but it was a rather busy week for me, so I did not get to put together as much information as I wanted to. So I have now come to the end of all the material that I have prepared for you guys. Let's see, Russell says, the buckets with the worm chow mix are in harvested, harvested every 14 days. The other buckets of worm bedding are top fed with worm chow and can be harvested after six weeks to six months. Okay. Oh no, I got here way too late. Thank you for the info today, by the way. Oh, yes, you're you're very welcome. Yeah. No worries, my friend. Okay, so that is all that I have prepared for you guys. How is your gardening going so far? Have you started planting anything outdoors yet? I am so, so excited because I only have three more weeks to go. And then after the three weeks, I'll be able to start putting things outside. But I was pretty disappointed this morning when I woke up and the temperature was minus two. It is May and we're still getting minus temperature. And I think they say we're supposed to have like um, minus seven tomorrow morning. So... I don't know. It is me and we're getting minus temperature. I'm just hoping that at least we won't get any snow. Okay, so you're not able to put anything outside yet, Russell. I see, Um, I know that there are people in my province that are actually planting things outdoors now. I've seen where one lady, she puts potatoes out. But she has it deep down into her container, so I don't know if maybe that is why she planted it because it is deep down in the containers that she's growing her potatoes in i know that some people at this point in time are actually starting their cool weather crops outdoors but i am not going to be putting anything out just yet i want to get an early start on the cool weather crop but i'm starting them indoors first because I don't trust those cutworms so for that reason I'm not going to be putting my cool weather crop out there just yet I must say though that my winter sowing did not do so well I don't know if maybe I should have continued watering the jugs when I put them out but for whatever reason only two of my jugs have any germination taking place in them and for those two jugs that things germinated in, it's just a few plants. So my first attempt at winter sowing seemed to be a failure. So I'll have to try again next year. See, Bajan says, Canada is just that way. You got away too, okay. Okay, Rossi says he planted potatoes for the first time this year. Okay, wish you all the best with your potatoes. Hope you have a nice harvest. Yeah, so I'll be planting this year for the first time. I'm going to be growing two varieties of potatoes. Don't ask me what, what varieties they are because it's just the store-bought potatoes and I did not see any names on the parcel, so I don't know. I only know that one has brown skin and one has red skin. So I don't know what variety they are, but anyway, we'll see. So I'm planting the red one this year for the first time. But I noticed something because when I was cheating the potatoes, I noticed that the brown ones, the stem tends to be skinny. And the red ones, the stem tends to be thick. So I don't know, is it something to do with the type of potato or what it is? Because both of them were in 
the same location. So I don't know why one set is skinny and one set is thick, but that's okay as long as they do well and produce me potatoes, I'll be happy. Let's see, Leafy Ricky says, I may put my butter crunch lettuce out after tomorrow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me know if you put them out, Leafy Ricky, let me know how they do outdoors. I kind of want to get an early start on those, on my um, cool weather crop, but I'm a bit timid because I've never really put anything outdoors before the growing season start but a few of the people that i follow from saskatchewan here i noticed that some of them will have cool weather crop like in april in the last week in april they will have cool weather crop in their garden so i don't know but i'm a bit timid to put them out there because i don't want to put them out there and then lose them and have to start all over again maybe i should throw some Saw some seeds out there just to see what happened. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll do that. Just sow just a few seeds and see how it turn out. Of course, that means I would have to go out every night to cover up. Let's see. My friend gave me russet and baby reds and a bag of calcium phosphate shake and bake style. Okay. Nice. Yeah, so I'm getting ready. My garden is ready. It's just waiting on the weather to warm up. After the weather warm up, then I can start putting things out. I got everything, everything ready to go so far in terms of the garden is prepped. And my seedlings are doing well. Some of them are actually getting a little bit too big at the moment. I don't really want to up -pot them because I'm so close, just three more weeks. So I don't want to up -pot anything that doesn't need to be up -potted. So we'll see what happens. It's going to be interesting this year because for the first time I'm growing flowers in my vegetable garden. And... So much changes this year compared to my previous gardening years in terms of what I'm growing because I'm growing a lot more different things this year. Last year I tried with sweet potato, but I didn't really know much about growing sweet potatoes in my region. So this year I'm going to be growing sweet potatoes and I'm going to be growing more than one variety of sweet potatoes. So it will be interesting to see what happens with my garden this year. I honestly don't know what to expect <laughs> because i'm growing quite a few more plants that i've never ever grown before so we'll see it will be fun though whatever happens i'm sure i'll be able to learn from it good or bad okay so that is all that i have to discuss today so if you guys don't have anything that you wish to talk about then i am going to say good night and i hope you guys have a lovely afternoon or night whatever it may be wherever you are <laughs> So thank you all for your participation.